and uh, thank you all for coming. I'm uh, glad that I got the opportunity to uh, speak to you about efficient focus or autonomous aging. Uh, I called it efficient focus, efficient because we're going to talk about sparse neural networks. So networks that use less parameters than, than their dense counterparts and focus because we want agents to learn to focus on the most task relevant features. All right, maybe one slide about me. So I'm a PhD candidate in, in the, at the TU Eindhoven in the Netherlands, started in 2021. Uh, I did one year of bachelor's in applied math in, in Boston. It was a bit too expensive to do more years there. So I came back to the Netherlands and did my master's also at the TU Eindhoven, applied mathematics and also science education. So I have the license to be a mathematics teacher in the Netherlands. And uh, yeah, now I'm a PhD and currently visiting here. So today we'll talk about uh, these two papers. One of them uh, was published as a full paper at AMOS this year uh, on the left, automatic noise filtering with dynamic squash training in deep RL. And we also went to the Spark Neural Networks workshop with that at, uh, at ICLR. And this one is the latest work, MADI, uh, learning to mask distractions for generalization in visual deep reinforcement learning. And that one is uh, under submission at NERVS at the moment. Um, so first we'll go into a &M, and then Mari, and at the end I'll also talk briefly about some potential future work or extensions to these uh, projects. All right, so first of all, why do we want to do automatic noise filtering? Well, I have two uh, real world examples of what you could think of in, in this regard. So first of all, this could be a, a household robot in the future that we all hope to have um, that could get features all kinds of features from the house as input. Like what is the stock in the fridge? What's the temperature in each room? All of this information you could give to the robot and for its current task that's doing, like one task, for example, baking pancakes or something, it only needs a very small subset of all those features to focus on, on that current task. And another example could be autonomous driving. So uh, uh, imagine that you're driving through Times Square in New York City and you're trying to focus on the other vehicles, the other pedestrians, uh, traffic signs, the road lines, but you don't want to be distracted by all the billboards or all the other irrelevant information. And just a clarification on the types of noise that we can talk about. So the first type might be uh, some uncertainty in your measurement, like the first image when the sun is right behind it, the traffic light, you might not be very sure what's going on, but that's not what we're gonna focus on in this work. I'm going to focus on the second type. So really uh, perceptions that are really irrelevant to your task. So like these distracting billboards. Okay, so what's the setting that we work in with uh, automatic noise filtering? Uh, we look at environments like humanoid V3 and we test uh, the well-known algorithm SAC, soft actor critic on this. And if there's no extra noise in the environment, I'll show you in a minute how, how we add that then SAC is able to learn well and get 5,000 uh, reward at the end of uh, a million time steps. But if we look at an environment where there's 80% of the input features are really noise and not relevant to the task, or 90 even, then SAC is not able to learn anymore. And how we do that is uh, the following. So we came up with our own uh, new benchmark, so to say. We defined the extremely noisy environment, E and E, where we take the features from the Majoka gym environments like half cheetah or, or humanoid. These, these are the task relevant features. And then we add a bunch of features that we just sample from a random uh, Gaussian distribution. And these are the noise features, the irrelevant features. And this could be very large. So we test for different fractions of noise all the way up to maybe 99% where just 1% of the features is really relevant to your task. And what we then do, is we define a network that gets all of these features as input. We don't tell the network which features are relevant, of course. It has to learn that by itself. And what we do is we sparsify the input layer. So as you see, not all the connections that are possible are there in the input layer. And throughout training, we adjust the structure of the network. This is just randomly initialized. And what we hope that ha happens at the end of training is something like this. So look at the input layer. All the connections have adjusted, or predominantly, almost all of them. There could still be some connection to the noise features, but we hope that most of the connections adjust their location 
to connect with the relevant features. By the way, if there's any questions, feel free to uh, raise your hand or interrupt. Sorry, so in the animation and some, some of the weights go missing, does that mean the weights is going to zero or you drop the connection altogether? So in our implementation, no weights go missing, actually. We keep the number of weights constant. So they are all like relocated to other locations. Okay. Yeah, you could also think about decreasing the number of weights or, or even growing them adaptively, but we didn't do that. Yeah. So what's the start configuration? The start configuration is just the random, randomly chosen connections, whether they're there or not. Just to clarify, are you applying dropout or? No, we are. We do not do dropout, but I see there there are some similarities between dropout and and doing this. So dropout, every batch they select a new set of weights to randomly drop out, and we have a still a for a certain time this connectivity is fixed. I'll show you in a minute how we adjust it later on. All right. So how do we adjust that network towards a more uh, a more optimal network, so to say? We use dynamic sparse training. So what that does is you start with a randomly sparsified uh, layer, and you train these weights as you would do normally. So you train the weights, say, for a 1,000 time steps, something like this. It could also be 200 or 400, something like this. This is a hyperparameter that's quite important for dynamic sparse training. Like, how often are you going to do these adjustments? So we train for a thousand time steps in this way. And then we look at, okay, what are all the weight values currently? What are their magnitudes, the absolute values? We sort them and the 5% weakest weights that are closest to zero, those are the ones we prune. And we regrow randomly in new available locations, uh, new weights. And we re reinitialize them with weight zero. You could also think about resetting it to a random weight, but uh, we tried both and zero was working just fine. And this is how you continue. So now you have your new structure, you train again for a thousand weight updates. You look at, okay, what are the weakest weights right now? We remove 5%, this 5% is also a hyperparameter that you could try to tune and you regrow the same amounts of weights again in new locations. And this is how the network sort of evolutionary searches for a uh, better structure. I assume since the weights the initial input to the current engineer level, we do not compare that with level one, level two, or anything else. Exactly. So not in this work. In this work, we only specify the input layer because that's where they, these, these noise features and relevant features can really be distinguished. But other works really also specify further layers. Yeah. How did you choose the initial number of weights? Uh, so yeah, this is also something you you need to try out. Uh, but it was fairly simple to find a good working uh, value. We we went with eighty percent sparsity for all experiments. So that means in the input layer, only twenty percent of the potential connections are actually active. When you prune a connection, is there any chance that it comes back or is that one not forever? Yeah, it can come back. Yeah, so a weight can be pruned, and then much later in training, it can come back again. And I think. This is also a good thing because in reinforcement learning, we have this, this change of distribution over time. You're seeing different states as you get better. So at the beginning, a weight might not be very important, but then at the end, it could become important. So it's it's good that it, they can come back, I think. All right, so these are the four environments that we tested on in this work. And here's also their, their state dimensions and action dimensions. And notice that if we go to a... Uh, an extremely noisy environment, for example, this last column here, it has a noise fraction of 99%. So that means 99% of the input is, is noise and just 1% are the relevant features. And this means that the state space is now 100 times as big as it used to be. So that's just something to keep in mind. All right, so our best result was on, was on humanoid. And if you have like 90% noise features, like what we saw in the first graph, uh, SAC and also TD3, by the way, with their dense networks, they're not able to learn well on this uh, tricky environment. But if you do add ANF automatic noise filtering to their environments, to their algorithms, I mean, sorry, then they're able to get back that nice uh, return of 5,000 again. And also on other environments, we saw uh, significant improvements, even up to like 98% noise features. Uh, adding ANF can really help to, to boost the improvement. <laughs> What happens in zero percent noise? Zero percent noise. It's uh, 
that's a good question. It can be better sometimes, and sometimes it's a little bit worse. So it's about it's about the same points. Yeah, because if you don't have any added noise, there can still be some benefit of looking at what are the most relevant features that are coming out of this environment, and other features might be less relevant, so you connect less to that. I have some slides all the way at the end, some extra slides if you want to see uh, the actual graph where we show all the different noise fractions that we tried, and zero is one of them. Okay. Uh, this is some analysis on what is actually happening. What type of connections are we making? So here we see over time on the vertical axis, we see the average numbers of connections. And the pink one is the average numbers of connections to task relevant features. And the brown one is the average numbers of connections to the noise features. And we see that right from the beginning of training, these updates make sure that the network learns to connect more and more to the task relevant features and less to the noise features. So this is exactly what we hope for. Although you do see that it doesn't really go all the way to zero. So there's there are always still some connections to the noise features, but there's a big enough gap that you have enough of this uh, benefit. Right. Some uh, extensions. So we also looked at what if the if the noise is louder. So first we sampled only in uh, a Gaussian distribution with the uh, unit noise. But now we're going to try louder noise. So the sigma is going to go up. And this makes the environment more difficult. So SAC especially struggles to learn something really well in this setting. And ANF SAC is still able to be quite robust even against this, this louder noise. And you can also see that in the behavior uh, on some videos, this is on noise amplitude eight. Uh, then SAC really struggles to, to walk well. And, and ANF SAC has this nice galloping motion that I like to see in this environment. So I guess you guys have already seen these videos like a hundred times, but what I really <laughs> like about App Cheetah is that it really resembles the galloping motion of an actual cheetah. Two legged. It is two legged though, instead of four, yeah. It's called half cheetah, that's the way, yeah. <laughs> that was the final performance. Yeah. And yeah. after how many time steps, like how would the learning curves look like? How fast? This is, is a, a million time steps. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we also looked a little bit into a light version of transfer learning, you could say. So what if this household robot that we were talking in about at the beginning, it's getting all these input features, it's doing a certain task, and now it, it gets a new task. So it might have to learn to do this new task, but a different subset of features is relevant for this other task. So we simulated that by still using the same environment, but after we have a fully trained agent, as you see, the connections are, are well placed. We now permute where the relevant features are coming in. So now the agent has to relearn, okay, where do I need to connect? And uh, we just keep doing the same procedure with dynamic sparse training and hope that after training again, the connections will be uh, reset to these new uh, relevant features. And this is indeed what we see uh, what happens. So ANF TV3 was able to quickly recover after every reset of the environment in every million time steps we permute these features. And uh, you see that TD3, the dense networks kind of lose their plasticity, so to say. So they're not able to readjust again uh, the right weight values for the right uh, relevant features. So then you're, you're constantly learning. It's not, it's not a train and testing. It's constantly adjusting the weights. Yeah. We argued that was because the environment is um, it's not I D. It's going to be distribution so it's just during a And here you did it by you know, a big abrupt change. But it's also happening gradually. Or you know, this, it's important to look at, at that billboard, but but actually the stop sign. Maybe it's good to look at the billboard or something like that. Yeah, we didn't try any of those gradual changes, but I could see something that might not be relevant in the beginning and it become relevant becomes relevant over time or something. But I think that this method would still be able to handle that. And, and if you keep doing those adjustments, uh, you have this plasticity still and you're able to, uh, to account for that, I think. If you look at noise camera that says it's very they have lots of things and after a while you start hundreds of the world's life and it's harder to remove the Yeah, so what we do is remove and regrow five percent of the active connections and we keep that constant. Okay. But you could say, let's try to, in the beginning, you need to learn a lot and then remove a lot 
and then do some cosine decay on that hyperparameter. And people do that a lot in supervised learning, yeah. but in RL, like I said, this distribution shift, yeah, I think it makes sense to, to keep adjusting as you go. So there's no loss of sorry, so, yeah. so it's looking at the uh is it those standard errors in the plot? So the shaded regions and you call those standard errors away. Yeah, it right. is a bit big here. Yeah. Right. So it's like, I guess by the time you reset it twice, then it's it's like the standard is a lot bigger. Yeah. It's like, that's that's like you keep doing it further and further. So like you also have a drop in plasticity, as you say. Yeah, I think that it, it's definitely not 100 percent solved in these. Okay. Uh, but what also might be going on here is that. This, this permutation, we also do randomly. So you might be lucky in some cases where the relevant features of the old task overlap a lot with the new task, and then you don't have to readjust a lot. Right. And some difficult ones, you have to readjust a lot. And then, so if you're unlucky, the performance is gonna be much worse. We, we just uh, average over all of those different settings. Thank you. I have the same question. Okay, nice. uh, And then the last extension that I'll talk about, or. Uh, for this work is we tried to look at, okay, how sparse can we actually make the full network? Can we uh, also prune connections in the hidden layer that we have instead of just the input layer? And uh, that is also possible. But if you go too far, so to say, if you sparsify too much, then the performance uh, starts to really drop. But you can sparsify all the way up to like 90%. So just 10% of the whole network connections is really there. And then you still have the same performance on these tricky environments as the dense uh, networks. All right. So on to the next uh, project. Are there remaining questions on ANF? <clears throat> also possible to ask at the end if you want. Did you try to draw the features completely after that is on top of the steps of checking that you find which features are not used very much? I see. That would be even smarter, I think. Yeah, that could be a nice extension of if you notice that, okay, this feature has really not a lot of connections, we can completely ignore it from now on. <laughs> and that would be, uh, might be even stronger. Yeah, we haven't done that. Oh, maybe from first? Uh, you, so the input features are partitioned into the good ones and the total noise ones. Yeah. But in reality, every feature has some amount of signal and some amount of noise. Exactly. I would assume this way of picking which ones are good and only picking a very small subset of them wouldn't necessarily work in real world when every feature, uh, feature has some amount of usefulness. Yeah, no, right? it's a good point. I, I'd love to try this out in, in, in more realistic benchmarks as, as you propose, kind of. Um, I've also talked with like a mechanical engineering professor in Eindhoven and she was building uh, sensors for soft robotics. And she was looking into how much sense, how many sensors do we need to place and where do we need to place them? Uh, and I was talking to her, maybe you can just place them everywhere, use a lot and then run ANF on that to see which ones it, it's connecting most to. It's kind of doing some feature selection here yes. in RL. Um, so that, that might be a use for, for this algorithm, something like that. The online question? What heuristic do you use to prune out the irrelevant hidden layer connections? Ah, a good question. So that's just the same way as the uh, as the input layer. So we look at the weight values of the hidden layer and remove the five percent uh, weakest ones that are of the active weights. All right. Here we go. So on to the next project. Oh, one more question. Sorry. Yes. Uh, why do you limit it to R L? Uh, yeah, that well, was just our scope of the paper, but it might might work even. Uh, there is some work on doing. There is some work on on doing feature selection with sparse neural networks in in supervised learning. So uh, and th this was actually inspired by that. Uh, so yeah, it's definitely possible to do it in other fields as well. Thanks, CV type continual learning. Yeah, there's a lot of sparsity in continual learning literature too. Okay, so with Madi masking distractions, we try to generalize this work 
not from vector-based environments, so getting a vector of features as input, but now we're getting pixels, like images as inputs. So we're supposed to learn how to walk forward as fast as possible on the on the top left one, and um, and now learn this from from pixels. And now we're going to train on these on these regular environments, and then we're going to try to generalize towards environments that have distracting backgrounds and also uh, camera angles that are changing and the agents can change color. There's not really shown in this picture because this is one of the easier ones still, but this is a really hard benchmark called the distracting control suite that we're trying to uh, trying to attack with this work. So we train on the environments on the left and we test on the environments on the right without doing any fine tuning on them. So how do we do that? We don't use any sparsity anymore in this work because we were thinking about doing that, sparsifying the first convolutional layers that really look at this picture, but they have they usually have kernels that glide over the image and sparsifying them doesn't make the same kind of sense as, as sparsifying a, an MLP layer in the previous work. So we came up with a different kind of architecture. The, um, the blue modules already existed. So you have a convolutional uh, layers, a lot of convolutional layers in the encoder then a huge MLP for the actor and multiple MLPs for the critic. And we added a very small network called the masker net, which just has 0.2% of the total number of connections. And this takes in the image, maybe also with some augmentation. That is what a lot of methods already do to try to become robust in generalization. And it outputs a, a mask saying, these are the important pixels that you should focus on. So it outputs values between zero and one, which you then element-wise multiply with the input that you're getting. So let's look into what does this mask net actually look like from the inside and, and how does it learn? So it gets the three RGB channels as input. It just has uh, three convolutional layers, 32 channels in each layer, and it outputs uh, this one channel of, of zeros and ones, which is then multiplied again by this input to, to output uh, the right uh, image for the rest of the network. And it learns the weights for these networks are learned without any new loss function. The loss function is still the same as the critic loss. So the intuition there is if you start to mask really relevant pixels, then the critic loss will be high because the critic is not able to detect anymore what is going on in this picture. So the, the really essential pixels you need to leave unmasked. And that's how this mask net gets incentivized to to, to uh, leave the right pixels unmasked, the relevant ones. And at initialization, the network is uh, initialized such that the outputs are really close to 0 0.5 because we don't know where each pixel needs to go yet. So the initial mask looks really great, just like a gray square. You multiply it by the actual observation and then in the middle, you see the, the mask observation. And after just 20,000 time steps, it's already learning very well to recognize, okay, these are the relevant pixels, and this is where the agent is, what we're supposed to be looking at. And notice that if we really look closely, if you squint your eyes at this image, you already see the shape of the agent kind of in this initial mask network, because this is not, it is randomly initialized, but it does get as input such a picture. So you can already kind of start to see the mask arising uh, from that initial input. Okay, and then these were the results. So I'll show you some videos. This is on the, the training environment, walk or walk. And then on the top right, you see the output of the masker after it's been multiplied by the observation. And also in the generalization case, <laughs> you have like a video playing. This is from a real estate database where they just have videos of houses and <laughs> gardens working <laughs> around. <laughs> so we're trying to learn more ones that are able to walk in any house, kind of, so to say. <laughs> And um, yeah, we had we had pretty good learning curves on, on this benchmark. This was called video hard. So you see in this benchmark, the camera angle was not changing. It was just the video playing in the background. And um, yeah, we were after 500,000 time steps. That's for how long we trained. We were able to, to outperform the baselines in uh, walk for walk, but also in uh, the five other environments that we tried. Uh, ball in cup catch was a bit, um, SGQN was also really good there. 
could you quickly remind us what SGQNS? SGQN is, is another baseline which recently came out, so it's not well known yet, I think. It stands for saliency guided Q network. So it's also trying to, to recognize where the important pixels are, but it's looking in a totally different way than, than with this masker net approach. And but I want to be honest, this was the video hard benchmark where we were really good, but we also included results uh, in the appendix on the distracting control suite, and we were just not so good there yet. So on the middle column, we were pretty okay on carpool swing up and carpool balance, but on walker walk and walker stand, we just still suck. So we, uh, we still have some work to do to, to catch up there. Um, yeah. That's because of the colors, like your walker looks yellow. Yeah, the colors change a bit in this environment, and also the the camera angle changes, which, so to say, you, this kind of makes the ground also relevant, you could say, because if you're really changing the camera angle by a lot, and you, you mask out the complete ground, then you might not know what the orientation of your agent actually is. So this becomes harder to really mask out the right areas of, of the image, I think. Did you tell the masker, just mask out the background, don't mask the walker? No, no, we don't tell it anything. We Why doesn't it learn to identify the ground first? Yeah, that's what we're trying to analyze right now. Yeah, good question. Right. So, do we still, like preset uh, masking ratio, or is that also learned? Uh, that is learned. Yeah, it's, there's no ratio that is trying to optimize towards. It. it can learn that by itself. So, for example, the SDQ one baseline does have a ratio like that that you have to set. Yeah. And it can be difficult to set it for a card pull. The agent is smaller, so you need a, a, a smaller ratio. And we wanted to be able to generalize without with just one algorithm. Yeah. Um, and we looked into a little bit of like, what are the masks actually looking like? And especially in this last column, so distracting control suite, you see that sometimes it's really mass starting to mask too much. And that could be a reasons why it's just not performing very well on, on that benchmark yet. So uh, yeah, we're trying to look into reasons. What what can we do here to to get that to improve? So if you try a log and then decide to turn left here, it's probably very relevant. You have experiments where you show that it's sort of applies where the agent is, but also there's like cues from the environment that's occasionally are relevant. Yeah, that's a good point. Like for many tasks, you need to unmask not only the agent but also other relevant so, objects. Um, one example of that could be like this, this finger spin environment where you are controlling the finger. So you could say the agent is the finger and this object on the other is just a free object on a, on a pin that you're supposed to spin. So in that case, if for video hard, it is unmasking both of them. So it's showing both of them. So this is a kind of a first uh, effort in that. But for the distraction control CGI, yeah, it is really showing that it's often masking too much. Again, it's only occasional. Well, it's actually, but once a while there's a side. Yeah, no, definitely a lot more uh, research needs to be done before you would like apply this in the real world. But I, I can see your your concerns there. Yeah. Um, okay, then we will talk about some uh, potential extensions to this work that I'm happy to work on or maybe even collaborate with some of you. So let me know if you're interested in one of these. Um, we're looking to do MADI on, on other benchmarks. So for example, the autonomous driving that you were talking about. So Carla is a nice uh, car learning to act uh, benchmark, which has different weather backgrounds and different uh, distractions that we want to test this. So if anyone has experience with Carla already, let me know. Uh, there's also this work uh, with the Vento arm. In our lab, somebody is. Uh, some people are, are are playing with that, and I'd love to test out if this arm is also able to work in a kitchen, or in a greenhouse, or in a factory, or something like that. So, with, with many different backgrounds, I would think that Mari could could help on on this. Um, and we might also be able to combine the approaches still from ANF and and from Mari, but instead of specifying right in the input layer with the convolutional neural networks. Uh, convolutional layers, we can also specify a little later in the networks when the MLP layers start. So let's dive into the regular, how the regular network use looks like without the, the, the masker net now. And we're going to look at the inside of this encoder block, which looks like this. 
So it has many layers, 11 convolutional layers. It gets in nine channels because you're getting three RGB channels per frame, but we're also getting three frames to see some movement in the environment. And uh, eventually this ends up being 32 channels of 21 by 21, which if you multiply all those values, it's flattened towards a huge uh, vector of 14,000 features. And this huge vector is then projected onto a vector of just 100 features. But this is a huge layer and multiplied by each other is uh, 1.4 million parameters. So I'm thinking to sparsify, start sparsifying in this layer now where we can really recognize, okay, what are the important features that our convolutional neural network has figured out? And can we start sparsifying there? So last week I've run some first experiments with that. Um, I called it sparsity enhanced focus, SEF, just gave it a name. Um, sparsity 80% in that layer and also 90% I've tried. Um, we see the return, the generalization performance on video hard again. And for card pole swing up on the left, 90% seems to be doing pretty well compared to the dense baseline, which is Svea, what we build upon. And um, on walk or walk, the performance was not as good. So it can really depend on the environment, how, how, uh, how well this works. There's still a mask card here. No, so there's no mask card okay. now. But you could even still add that, and then it might be make more sense even to sparsify and, and look at the relevant features, yeah. That might be the next thing I'm going to try out. Where would mask card lie in this graph? Just mask card? Uh, just the mask. It's, yeah. a, it's a little bit above SPEA usually on the video hard benchmark. And then the last uh, project that I'm thinking about is doing transfer learning with Madi. So if you already have learned a good masker network on uh, walker stand, then you might also be able to really quickly learn how to do walker walk if you have these distractions in the background that, that the, the masker net can, can filter. And same for from carpal balance to carpal swing up. So in carpal balance, the, the ball starts straight up and in swing up, you have to also swing it up, making it a little bit harder. And I'm also wondering, can we generalize from or transfer from walker stance to a different domain like Carpool Swinger. Uh, then the masker net would also need to be adjusted, I think. All right, thank you very much. So main takeaway, ANF and MADI outperform uh, standard deep RL methods by uh, learning to focus on past relevant features. And um, here's the, the, the ANF paper on archive, uh, my GitHub link. And by the way, here is, something on that GitHub, I wrote a little sparse uh, sparse training tutorial where if you're interested in, in, in doing this kind of work, you can uh, check it out and uh, ask me any questions if you if you want, if you have any. So yeah, thank you very much. Um, for research on sparse neural networks, what is the novelty there compared with other sparse? research, sparsity research. So for this first work, yeah. the novelty there was that uh, people ha had, had not tried out uh, using sparse neural networks for these kinds of environments where only a very small subset of the features are really relevant to your task. And uh, so yeah, that- Yeah, people have applied similar ideas to from the neural networks, right? For example, the yeah. neural ways, they just trap the small ways to zero. So the basic idea is similar. Yeah, yeah, that's true, yeah. So in uh, in this department, uh, there's this line of work that, that's super popular, gaining traction, it's called generate and test. Okay. I haven't heard of it. Not yet. It seems very, I don't know generate and test, but to me, everything seems similar. So generate and test seems super similar to this work where they have multiple utility measures, like they just don't look at the magnitude of weights. Uh, I don't see any generate and test person here. Right? Okay, okay. Okay, anyway. So I'll, uh, I'll, ask yeah, I'll ask you for two things. But yeah, I think adding on to what Shuram said, they also have the pruning last 5% and 10% of the features. And then we initialize it again. There might be some similarity. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It sounds very similar. Yeah. <laughs> this, this last task of oh, what it's called, visual, the hard video one. Yeah. That's a stupid task, right? So <laughs> you can't really solve it without encoding. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. You can't really solve it without putting in domain knowledge, right? You're expecting the agent to just learn to solve in this star, uh, starry night and then 
you test it out in a completely different environment. If I were testing it out in that environment, that's more reasonable. Then I maybe don't need to put in any domain knowledge. Yeah, but on the other hand, people have tried just training directly on that video hard one, and that doesn't work. So there's too much distractions going on if you just train directly on that. So you kind of need the, the clean data of that blue starry night background you were talking about to, to learn first how to even walk, how to even do the task. And then you can start to learn to generalize towards more difficult backgrounds, it seems. So, and then they use a lot of augmentation. So uh, what is often done is they take a, a, a data set of images. That's not the same data set, of course, as this, this real estate videos, but a huge data set of images that you take your, your, your environment image, you take that random image, and you just take half the pixel values of each and put them together. And that's your augmentation. That's often used now. So this idea that you take 5%, going back to Russ's questions earlier, um, that you always keep changing 5%. It doesn't seem to be intuitive to me from the point of view of how we learn, right? So if there is an example of something completely new that I have never seen before, I am likely to be adjusting lots of my ways, yeah. right? Yeah. And then the second example that will shift my knowledge about that domain will also be adjusting quite a bit of my ways. But then when I get the 200 one, it's likely that I'm going to be doing very little adjusting. Right. So the idea of a kneeling seems to be a feeling where you can start with much more than 5% in the beginning. Yeah. Right. But as you learn, then the probability of so so basically instead of a five percent, there should be certain probability that for the number that you will change. Yeah. And that should uh, it seems to me that there should be a curve where yeah, as, like as a I learn, kneeling schedule. Yeah, as, yeah. as I learn, I do last change. Yeah. Just for the intuition. Yeah, this is this is often applied in, in the sparsity literature, especially in supervised learning. Like I said, when you know your task is going to end. Um, if you don't know when you're going to get a new task, then this might be tricky. But uh, if you do know, like, ah, now I'm doing a new task, then you can indeed reset it to, to a higher value. And I, I agree, this could be a promising. Yeah. People have a hard time also adjusting. Yeah. Yeah. People have a hard time also adjusting after the ingrained. Speaking of the hosting, uh, if your has a uh, lower size or bigger size, how does mass work? Oh, that's a good question. We, we've just tried on, on, on these environments, which always have 84 by 84 pixels. Um, so right now, I would need to adjust the, the architecture, I think, for, for bigger pixels, or, or you would need to, those bigger images, scale them down to 84 by 84. But yeah, it's a good question. Um, how would masking perform on the first task? So say I had a mask layer instead of uh, the sparse thing. Original task would have Gaussian features and- Yeah, yeah. Um, then you would need also a different kind of mask in that, that, that doesn't output a, 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 an image mask, but just a, a vector, like which one are you gonna have to? But I, I think this could also work, yeah. yeah. It's an interesting question. How would that be different from just a regular network? Well, because it, as output, it now has a, a vector of like, uh, which which uh, features am I going to let through or not? Or you can output it, still have an output of the matrix of these connections, which, are, which am I going to activate or not? Um, but this is, in images, the pixels that are relevant can really change per time step, right? If your agent is in this position, these pixels are relevant. And then the next time step it's here, these pixels are not relevant anymore. While for the original environments, those same features stayed relevant all the time. Oh, maybe this is related to what Russ was saying, gradual changes. If yeah. gradual changes, it becomes exactly the same as the image type. Then it might make sense to try, try this out there, yeah. Also, it's interesting you put both these in the same slide. The first idea is not learning based, it's just, Random search, I guess. And then the second idea is more learning based and would suffer from, I guess, uh, so if you randomly change the environment, it won't be able to catch up. Whereas the first method might be able to catch up because it's random. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. And